I've got AIDS. I'm gay. I'm homosexual. I contracted HIV and I'm sorry, but now it's AIDS. Russell T. Davies' Channel 4 series might be fiction, but the world it depicts was all too real. It's a sin starts like so many other coming of age TV shows and films. This is Richie. He says he's bisexual, so he can have sex with you or me. So, what do you want to do? Wrestle for him? <laughs> Young people escaping their homes in search of a dazzling future in the big city. But for this gang of friends who find each other in London's gay community in the early 80s, a shadow is looming. Insidiously, the AIDS epidemic creeps into their lives, first through radio and TV news reports, then scurrilous tabloid rumors and hushed talk in bars, until suddenly the mystery illness reaches people they know. Though the plot and characters are fictional, creator Russell T. Davies drew on his own experiences as a young, gay man growing up during the 80s for It's a Sin. As such, the stories that emerge from the series are a true depiction of how British society ostracized and pilloried those living with and dying from this horrifying new disease. You're not infectious. Not to me. In episode one, when Colin, Callum Scott Howells, the gentle apprentice Taylor, goes to visit his friend Henry, Neil Patrick Harris, in hospital, he finds him locked up, alone in a ward, with his meals dumped outside the door. When another character is diagnosed with AIDS, he's also put under lock and key in hospital, this time legally, under a public health act. Meanwhile, funeral homes refuse to bury the bodies of those with AIDS-related illnesses, while families burn the belongings of the deceased. These shameful cases haven't been embellished for dramatic purposes, says Ian Green, CEO of the Terence Higgins Trust, THT. The producers of the show consulted with THT, the charity's former director of policy acted as an advisor on the series to help develop storylines that reflected situations gay men actually found themselves in during the 80s. The story of the main character locked up under the Public Health Act, says Green, this was a real life the case that the trust was involved with and did a lot of campaigning work on. With legal help, who you can also see in the series, we for it really hard to have that person released. Green, who was 18 at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, adds, there was so much misinformation around because people didn't know what the virus was. But it's actually really, really simple because I've got some news for you. Got news for you all. I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm gonna live. From politicians to the medical community, many people didn't want to know about it, and there was a real lack of understanding of how the virus was contracted, and that perpetuated the fear and led to the stigma that still remains today. Something wrong with your skin. There was a sense of doom in that we didn't know how it was going to pan out. The beginning of the AIDS and HIV crisis, the first cases of the new disease, were recorded in America in 1981, among the gay community, which led to it originally being labeled gay-related immune deficiency, GRID. Shortly after, the UK saw its first deaths, including Terry Higgins, who died in 1982 aged 37. Perhaps I can ask, what is it that you know? It's a death sentence. I don't think you should be on your own at a time like this. The conservative government of the day, led by Margaret Thatcher, failed to address the crisis until it had spiraled into an epidemic. From the first deaths, it took a staggering four years for the government to even put together a committee and public health messaging campaign. Wax and cold, his hand upon his heart to ne'er grow old, and now the heptarch stands without a king. In that time, it wasn't just a virus that was getting a stronghold, but the rumors and conspiracy theories around the disease. As the naive skeptic Richie, Ali Alexander, repeats in its A-Sin, they say it was set up in a laboratory to kill us. Sort of place. No, I'm just having a drink before I go back to the wine. Whoa. That's quite a bit of acting. It's the Russians. It's from the jungle. He also latches onto early messaging, which identified the groups most at risk as homosexuals, Haitians, hemophiliacs, and heroin users. He jokes, like there's a disease which just targets the letter H. Together? Um... Yeah. Who's it going to get next? People from Hartlepool? 
At the time, tabloids gleefully ran inhumane headlines like Britain threatened by gay virus plague, mail on Sunday, and I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. News of the world. Meanwhile, those living with the virus were demonized by establishment figures like the chief constable of Greater Manchester, James Anderton, a former minister who believed he had a direct line to God, who referred to patients as swirling in a human cesspit of their own making. For many on the religious right, who took issue with homosexuality on supposedly moral grounds, the disease now ravaging the gay community was considered some sort of divine retribution. It's good news. There's no sign of HIV. You're clear. And yeah, there's nothing to worry about. The test came back negative. <laughs> There was a huge focus on homophobia as this was affecting a marginalized group, Green says. This was a sense of pervading immorality, and gay people were seen as immoral. Many people said, well they deserved it, didn't they? It took an awful long time for politicians and clinicians to take action. The worst misstep in the handling of the crisis was the delay, not taking it seriously. It was people who set up the THT and activists who needed to fight to make it happen. Without the heroic willingness of these people in their protests, I worry the government would have taken much longer to take action, and many more thousands of people would have died. Don't die of ignorance, as the virus continued to spread, misinformation proved equally transmissible. In 1987, a full five years after the first AIDS deaths, the Football Association started the season by warning its players not to use communal baths or swap shirts at the end of matches. A campaign that accurately explained AIDS and the virus that caused it, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, was desperately needed. That came in the form of a hard-hitting advert known as the Tombstone Campaign. According to Norman Fowler, the health secretary at the time who was instrumental in its creation, it was the biggest public health campaign there's ever been in this country. The 42nd advert, directed by Nicholas Rogue, features explosions, dark metal chimes and an ominous tombstone with the word AIDS carved into it. The advert was groundbreaking because it targeted the disease rather than the people who were infected. For the first time, it made clear to the public that the virus could be passed on by sexual intercourse and that anyone could get it, man or woman. The spot finished with an enduring strapline, don't die of ignorance. Leaflets with the same title went through the letterbox of every household in the UK. They see AIDS as a chance to profit. There are now mixed feelings about this campaign among the community, Green explains. I want to give a huge amount of credit to Norman Fowler, who was one of the first politicians who took HIV seriously. He really had to persuade Margaret Thatcher to allow this national awareness campaign to take place. I'm certain it saved lives. However, with hindsight, it was so raw, even today many people's beliefs about HIV are based on what we knew in the 90s. It did an awful lot to perpetuate stigma. We now know that HIV is a manageable condition, that people on treatment can now have a normal life expectancy. Things have changed massively, but people's opinions haven't. But it was right for the time, and was absolutely vital. They now lucky them, I say. Would you do go for drinks? By the start of the 90s, high-profile celebrities and royalty began to use their platforms to raise awareness for the disease. Elton John set up his AIDS Foundation in 1993, and Princess Diana began visiting patients in hospital, where she reiterated it was safe to shake hands. Colleagues tell me she used to visit privately as well, says Green. She used to go in late at night and would sit with the young men to comfort them. Many of them were ostracized by their families, so many of them were dying on their own. To have somebody like the princess who would spend time with them was so important. Better about the whole thing at the moment. But certainly in the respect that um, the lead up to Princess Diana coming was, will she or won't she wear gloves? And she didn't. I mean, I believe she wouldn't and she's lived up to what I, I believe. She knew the facts. While there has been a vast progress in the treatment of AIDS and HIV in this country, it's no longer a death sentence, and with the right treatment, it's impossible for those living with HIV to pass it on. It's a sin will take many people back to a time of fear and confusion in the UK. 
I think it's really important that the generation today understands the real impact of HIV on the community and the pain that people still feel, says Green. I think it's going to trigger a lot in people of my generation. In my group of close friends, we lost four friends to HIV, and this is going to be a time we will remember them. But it will bring back tough memories. The fact that Russell T. Davies is doing it, he's an amazing writer and producer, there's no one better because of his own personal experiences of being a gay man at that time. None of my lords ring, why, he sent her none. I am the man. <laughs>